are called? 3,000 years ago, they created channels. Yes, some yeah. of them are as old as 3,000 yeah. years, which are called Kanat mm -hmm. or Kares, as mm -hmm. they are called. And, and these, for 10 kilometers, by pure gravity, mm -hmm. these channels flow under, mm -hmm. first come into the fields outside the town, mm -hmm. then go into the reservoirs, these beautiful reservoirs called yeah. Abanbars yeah. with yeah. beautiful cooling towers. Yeah, I saw the picture, yeah. It's lovely. And then uh, they go into the mosques, mm -hmm. and finally they go into the courtyard of every house. Courtyard of every, every house. house. So yeah. basically, the cooling tower that you see mm -hmm. is the end of okay. a massive piece of regional infrastructure okay. that is almost 2,500 mm -hmm. years old. Mm -hmm. And what's happening today is that the town has grown to 30 times its original mm -hmm. size, and nobody wants to use this infrastructure mm -hmm. anymore. Now, heritage conservation agencies like UNESCO and so on are trying desperately to preserve this infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So the pitch that we made was an alternative one. We, we, our argument was uh, you, you cannot uh, necessarily preserve mm -hmm. uh, indigenous hydro infrastructure mm -hmm. for nostalgic reasons. Uh, fact is, neither can it supply the water for the growing city, mm -hmm. nor would people be interested in it, mm -hmm. because it, the, the channel is made of mud, mm -hmm. it'll be contaminated, there are all kinds of issues. So what we pitched is what if you take these systems, mm -hmm. intervene with them, put mm -hmm. some technology, mm -hmm. uh, and actually collect all the gray water mm -hmm. that is coming from all these houses mm -hmm. where these canats mm -hmm. are connected. So gray water is water you know, which is not uh, mm -hmm. toxic. It's not uh, mixed mm -hmm. with feces or anything. Mm -hmm. It's water which you waste, say, when you're shaving mm -hmm. in the morning. So it's mm -hmm. water that can be treated locally. Mm -hmm. So you take the water. You collect it, you use the Kanat system to mm -hmm. bring the water back to mm -hmm. the Aban bars. Mm -hmm. But you have to do it against gravity, gravity now, so okay. you have to put motors. Mm -hmm. And you convert the Aban bars into treatment plants okay. and then return the water back, back to the to houses. Them, yeah. So, what you've done in effect, yeah. I mean, so what you've done in effect is you've taken the grid mm -hmm. of the city, mm -hmm. which currently gets mm -hmm. water from 5,000 miles away. I, and I think you've succeeded, you definitely will get the highest civil in award in Iran. Well, <laughs> the, problem, the problem with this project is Iran is a very difficult place to access, yeah. of course. Yeah. And plus, the, the system of Kanats that exists mm -hmm. has not, never been documented. Okay. So we're going to need some incredible, mm -hmm. incredible technology to understand where they are and what mm -hmm. to do. But it was a theoretical proposition, yeah. which we hope. But a brilliant one, but you're pursuing it. Yes, we are. Yeah. Okay, I think the uh, last discussion we could have is uh, basically the subject which is very close to my heart, urban art. Now yesterday while talking with you, you told me about uh, how a township was changed or a new township was yeah. created by sculptors who created art. Yes. I mean, uh, in Goa, it's been developed as a tourist place, but unfortunately we do not have anything semblance to urban art. Mm -hmm. The only man-made structure here was created uh, 500 years ago by the Portuguese, the Rome of the East, Old Goa. After that, we haven't been doing much man-made. We have the beaches and we have food. But uh, I mean, the Portuguese created Rome of the East and what we have succeeded a successive government is perhaps Los Angeles of the East with the casinos. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so now, urban art has a very important role to play. So can you tell me about this project where uh, a township developed around art? Yes, uh, it was Phoenix, the city of Phoenix in Arizona in the United States. And I think you should all look at it. I think it was in the early 70s or probably late 70s that the city of Phoenix hired two very well-known planners and urbanists mm -hmm. to come and do a master plan for their downtown. So mm -hmm. it was a very ambitious conventional project. Mm -hmm. And the expectation was that these planners would come and do a, a rezoning of the downtown and write new codes and mm -hmm. improve the streets and so on. Mm -hmm. now these were incredibly smart planners, uh, mm -hmm. William Morris and Catherine mm -hmm. Brown. Mm -hmm. And when they came to Phoenix and they looked around the city and they looked particularly at the administration of the city, mm -hmm. they realized that if they did a conventional master plan, <clears throat> yes, it would be progressive. But after they left, the city had absolutely no uh, knowledge or no uh, intellectual power to take this master plan ahead. Neither did they have trained staff, mm -hmm. nor did they have uh, any leader that was able to really shepherd this process. Mm -hmm. So what they did is all the budget that had been allocated to create this master plan, mm -hmm. they said, they proposed an alternative where they said, could you take the same budget and create a public arts commission? So forget the master plan, we'll, okay. we'll, we'll change your downtown, mm -hmm. but the modes of change are going to be different. Mm -hmm. So they formed a public arts commission. The public arts commission invited a bunch of creative artists mm -hmm. and they unleashed them with the budget yeah. to say, go and take these identified sites throughout the city mm -hmm. and Great. just let your creativity loose. Mm -hmm. 
and it has been an incredible renaissance because what these people did is they went and took abandoned chain link fences and mm -hmm. freeways, mm -hmm. uh, sides of freeways and just made them beautiful installations. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the land value mm -hmm. that was around these places mm -hmm. shot up. Okay. And as a result, more developers came in and the city began to shepherd it now because okay. the city is so... And so, so I, I think that art, mm -hmm. public art, if mm -hmm. done more strategically, uh, can become an incredible catalyst mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. urban reform uh, with a little bit of backing from the right people. Yeah, very right. I think uh, we have to invest in public art in India, especially in Goa. I'm rather very sad that I feel for the last almost three, four hundred years there has been no public art of substance happening in India. Mm -hmm. The last public art, in my opinion, is Hampi during the Vijayanagar Empire. Yes. We of course have had some good buildings and some good sculptures, but in general, something of that caliber, Vajinta, Laura, uh, that has not happened. Right. And uh, uh, there are many reasons. One of the reasons actually we were discussing yesterday was uh, the kings of uh, those days the were patrons. used to looking at art. Mm -hmm. So they were exposed to art, so they could choose the right sculptors. And today's MLA in general is uh, not, uh, I mean, sort of. Uh, uh, competent enough to choose art and it's not their job to choose art. There mm -hmm. should be some kind of urban art commission. So can you tell us a, a kind of a system which is followed in choosing public art in your part of the world? Well, I think different cities have different ways of doing it and uh, I don't think there is a one shoe fits all answer. They all have merits and demerits. I mean, in the US, many cities do actually have a public arts commission. Mm -hmm. The demerit of such commissions is often they tend to become very bureaucratic. Okay. So, uh, you know, if you want to do a very small installation, you have to have two hearings okay. where a so-called set of experts okay. gives you opinions yeah. and so okay. on. Uh, so, I think over-regulating anything is a danger. Yeah, art cannot be totally regulated. Uh, exactly. <laughs> yes, yes. And, you know, on the other hand, the other extreme, you have uh, Nekchand in our yeah. India. Yeah. I mean, you have Chandigarh, yeah. the famous story, where this man was yeah. Or surreptitiously yeah. collecting. Yeah. Uh, he was working as a supervisor in yeah. PWD exactly. road construction. Yeah. And he was just doing it from his heart away yeah. in the forest yeah. and you know, the rest is history. We yeah. began. And, and there's a great amount of magnet, more magnetism today yeah. to his park yeah. than the Ch yeah. Corbusier's yeah. capital. Yeah, right. you know, everybody who goes to Chandigarh goes to visit Rock, the exactly. Rock Garden. You have been working all over the world, uh, in America, in Japan. Uh, oh, uh, are you facing too much of sort of uh, this political interventions, bureaucratic hurdles everywhere or some countries are better than the others? What is your experience? Well, uh, I think that's a good question. I think that all planning of any kind, all cities, I strongly believe have to be understood em empathetically uh, in the light of their political structures. Mm -hmm. I, I think a city is a big political engine. Mm -hmm. And if you don't engage with the political engine, you're not really doing planning mm -hmm. because when you think about it, this is why I say cities are not made by architects. Mm -hmm. Because before you bring an architect or a designer into the picture, there are a number of decisions that are already being made by administrators, politicians, investments, budgets, all yes. these things are decided. Yes. And then you bring you know, the, the planner and the architect. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very important for people who are engaged in urban reform to go to the highest level, to not be afraid to engage. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that mean? Uh, for example, every city is different, not only because of the way it looks, mm -hmm. but because of the way it's governed. Mm -hmm. If you look at cities in the United Arab Emirates, mm -hmm. uh, Dubai, for example, mm -hmm. or Abu Dhabi, they are essentially monarchies. So yes. basically you have a sheikh, mm -hmm. uh, and then you may have a city department. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, she the sheikh is supreme. Yeah. So what is happening in, in Dubai and Abu Dhabi is also, although there is this conventional planning going on, mm -hmm. Euclidean planning like mm -hmm. we call it, uh, there are a lot of decisions that are made quickly and fast, mm -hmm. uh, for better or for worse, mm -hmm. but it's a system that's in place, mm -hmm. which is literally impossible in a system like the United States. Mm -hmm. Because in the US, even if you want to change zoning, it has to go through, or if you want a mega project to mm -hmm. happen tomorrow, mm -hmm. You know, no politician can endorse it, or no king, there's no king, can endorse it and say, I want this done in mm -hmm. five months. Mm -hmm. It has to go through processes mm -hmm. like environmental impact report mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. The merit is it's a transparent regulation. Mm -hmm. The demerit mm -hmm. takes a hell lot of time. Mm -hmm. So even a very ambitious vision that could save the city mm -hmm. can take a long time yeah. to get finished. Yeah. Now you go to a place like China, the federal government owns all the land, yeah. so a developer never owns land, mm -hmm. a developer leases land. Mm -hmm. A developer in China can lease land for 90 years or 40 years mm -hmm. from the government. Mm -hmm. So 
one of the reasons China is developing so fast, mm -hmm. we have the fastest growing mm -hmm. cities in the world, is because when you have developers under the pressure that I only have 90 years or 40 years yes, so to bid, you're on a frenzy. So what I'm trying to say is, yes, we shouldn't condone them. Mm -hmm. uh, they are destroying the environment. Mm -hmm. But it is important for planners and urbanists not to preconceive, not to go into these places and say, mm -hmm. you are so bad, mm -hmm. this is the way your cities ought to be. I think we need to understand why they are that way. And they are that way because there are systems in place. So yes, when we do projects in China, for example, uh, it is difficult because you have to bang your head okay. against these kind of rules. Yeah, well, it was really nice talking to you. And uh, I think uh, it is time that uh, Goa government uh, looks at you and um, perhaps your wisdom and your empathy in urban planning, in urbanism um, is sort of... Uh, made a use of in your homeland. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a great <laughs> honor. So thank you.